Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Lab and BioArchive. With me, I have Tim Mitchison from Harvard Medical School. Tim, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you. And, um, and welcome back, because uh, you were saying earlier that you are an ERP, which for anybody who doesn't know is an undergraduate research project, is that correct? I was, I was, yes. I, was a, I came here as an undergraduate in 1979, and um, that was really the, sort of the pivotal point in my life. I, I hugely enjoyed it. And um, so one of the things that made me uh, come to America as a scientist afterwards. Okay, so what, what were you working on then? I worked with Mike Barchin, who's now at Berkeley, and my project was about how a DNA tumor virus integrates into human DNA. So um, uh, tumor virology, viruses that cause cancers was a big thing in Cold Spring Harbor back then. And um, I think my specific project was to figure out the site in a human cell that this virus had inserted itself. Um, I, I cloned that site out and using uh, 1979 technology when DNA cloning was still fairly early and I, like running a DNA sequencing gel was a huge feat in those days. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but also in some ways more fun, more, more kind of tactile and visual than it more is artisanal, now. artisanal, I suppose. Exactly, artisanal, <laughs> that, that's a good word. Yes, I, I remember running my first gel and Anyway, whatever. Anyway. It was a great experience. <laughs> <coughs> oh, that's great. So, from tumor viruses to tubules, you're going to be talking mm -hmm. tomorrow morning about microtubules. Microtubules, yes. yes. So, um, can you just remind everyone um, the the arrangement of microtubules in the cell? It's you know, in, in a typical animal cell, you have a sort of radial array and interphase, and it changes during mitosis. What, what what's the arrangement? Good. Yeah, exactly. So, so microtubules are these long, thin protein polymers that as the name, we use the word cytoskeleton, they're, they're the kind of, the, sort of like the bones of the cell, although they, they're very dynamic, they grow and shrink, and they're, they're transport tracks uh, for, for material. And in a, let's say a white blood cell that's crawling around in your body, the, the microtubules radiate out from a central point called the centrosome and uh, uh, transport material and help the cell stay organized as it moves. And then this meeting is very much about cell division. And when a, a cell divides, um, the DNA compacts into individual chromosomes and the microtubules are reorganized to build a structure called the mitotic spindle, which mm. sort of looks spindle-shaped. And the chromosomes attach to microtubules and then the microtubules actually pull the separated chromosomes into the two daughter cells. So it's this beautiful kind of dance uh -huh. of, of chromosomes where microtubules are actually doing the, the work of, of moving. And that was always my interest in cell division. It was less the, the DNA chromosome part and more this beautiful dynamic organization of microtubules that, that orchestrates the, the movement. Yeah, and so you, you, you said, I mean, you mentioned that they're dynamic and we should think of them very differently from the image that a, the notion of a skeleton right. immediately conjures up. So what, what controls the, um, the, the dynamics of, of, I mean, you know, they grow and shrink at, at one end. What's exactly, actually? exactly. That was actually my, my big break in science as a, as a PhD student. I got to be the first person to, to discover that microtubules grow and, and shrink continuously, powered by um, hydrolysis of a, of a high energy, uh, energy supply, GTP. And, and we call that dynamic instability. So it's out of sync. So different microtubules and growing and shrinking. And that allows them to kind of rearrange very quickly. And then the GTP hydrolysis also is the energy that the microtubules use to pull the chromosomes apart uh, in mitosis. So what's, what's, reg what's regulating those? Um, with a, with a, a single microtubule just growing and shrinking in the cell, we believe it's kind of spontaneous, actually. It's, it's sort of probabilistic, although often when a microtubule hits the edge of the cell, that will, will mechanically trigger it to shrink. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, 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 it's kind of spontaneous or hits a mechanical barrier. For the microtubules that touch a chromosome, they actually make a link through a structure called the DNA, and, and there's a complicated protein assembly that holds onto the microtubules, and, and so they are kind of attracted, like it's sort of like flypaper, that they, the microtubules join the DNA and then stick. And so, so you could say that these proteins attached to the DNA are kind of 
capturing the microtubules. Uh -huh. And so, what, and so, I mean, in both instances, during interphase before cell division and at cell division, yep. what's at the other end of the tubule? For, for that to work, it's got to be anchored. It's, yes, it's got to be anchored somewhere. And the microtubules, it was a really good question, and we worked a lot on that. The sort of canonical answer to that question is a structure called the centrosome, which is this small sphere in the center of the cell with a beautiful thing called a centriole in the middle. And the microtubules are nucleated there, so they're, they're generated there and they're held on there. And so a lot of them are anchored to the centrosome. But it's, it's more complicated than that in a way. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about actually the meiotic spindles in, in frog eggs, the unfertilized frog egg. And in fact, there isn't a centrosome there. So the, the minus ends of them, we call the end that attaches to the chromosome is called the plus end. The other end we call conventionally the minus end. The minus ends all gather together at the poles of the spindle and they're actually held in place probably by um, the motor protein dynein that kind of walks down and gathers uh -huh. them together. So I would actually say it's actually kind of a good question. I'm not sure we know the, the details the at that it. end. Yeah. But at some point, something must happen in the cell, circle, cell cycle to go from having one anchorage point to two to create the spindle. And yes, yes, and again, conventional view of that, and it's very true in a simple system like a, a budding or a, 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 a fission yeast, where, you know, these yeasts where a lot of the genetics of the cell cycle were first worked out, the microtubule organizing center, which is the equivalent of the centrosome, actually splits in two and separates, and so you have two points that grow out, and, and that's So you have a replication becomes, event first. You have right? a could call it a replication, but, but it's, it's not a nucleic acid, it's a protein mm. assembly. It's more like a growth and splitting, I would say. It's a little less precise than a replication. Right, right. However, again, in, that's one way of doing it, but in, in, in the frog egg system we use, it seems to actually be more a case of self-organization. So you kind of have a jumble of microtubules and they sort of magically sort themselves out. And in that case, the drive to, to be, we call it bipolar, so, oh. so having plus ends in the middle and minus ends, you know, like the fingers of your hand, we call that bipolar. A lot of that actually comes from a motor protein uh, called kinesin-5, which if, if two microtubules cross each other, the motor protein in the middle will, will push them apart and, and that come, they, they kind of self-organize. So, so this is, this, you know, I mean, so when most people think of uh, motor proteins, they think of things running up and down these tubules, transporting things. So this is basically the same, but it's connecting two exactly. together. Exactly. It right. transports one microtubule mm. on another. Uh -huh. And the, the bipolar organization of the, the frog egg spindle is really created by one set of motors pushing the microtubules apart in the middle and another set gathering the minus ends. And, and so you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a motor that transports one microtubule on another, okay. and there are two flavors that go in kind of in opposite directions. So that's a broad outline. H how that works in detail, you know, could you build a mathematical model of it? I, I think we're not that's quite there yet. But. And, so, and you mentioned um, looking at it in frog eggs. The frog eggs, so is, yes, I like I frog mean, eggs. Frog yes. eggs, and, and, and one feature of them is that they're extremely big compared yes. with regular yes. cells, like one, one millimeter? One millimeter, right? yes, yes, yes. So, what was, so, what, so what, was, what's, what was your reason for looking at frog eggs? Is, was it because of this size? No, not in the first place. I mean, a, a frog egg dividing, I don't know how many people have seen it with their eyes. It's a beautiful, I remember you know, seeing it in biology class at school. I, I sort of view a frog egg dividing as a, a kind of an icon of biology. We, we used to take frog so eggs around So it's an aesthetic school. choice then? <laughs> No, for me, um, it was really, I, I was trained as a biochemist and I like to use biochemical techniques and an appealing thing about a frog egg is you can, you can get a whole flask full of them and grind them up and have a lot of the proteins that make cells divide, um, you know, you have a whole bushel of those proteins, so it, it, it's, it's a sort of quantity and then also for studying cell division, a frog egg is set up to divide. I mean, it, it does nothing for the first, except divide for the first 12 or 13 divisions. Then things get more complicated and the cells start changing into different cell types. But the, a frog egg like, like or, 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 or other kinds of egg cells, uh, the complement of protein inside them is very much specialized to allow them to divide. So it's a rich source of cell division proteins. And, and so from a biochemical perspective, it's a good place to start. I mean. I had friends who 
instead of using frog eggs, my friend Bel Palazzo liked um, sea urchin eggs and clam eggs. These are uh, marine critters that mm -hmm. make eggs. And the same reason, except in that case, instead of, instead of getting a cup full like you can from a frog egg, you could get you know, a, a bucket full. Right. But frog eggs are a little closer to man. They're, they're vertebrates, they're amphibians. So frog eggs are a nice choice. It's sort of somewhat close to human biology, we would like to understand. And, and yet still, you can get it in biochemical quantities. So that, that was really the reason for starting in frog eggs. And a point I actually make in my talk, it was I was just looking back at what we've published in frog eggs over the years. And I was realizing in, in the 1990s, we very much thought of frog eggs as a model for human cells dividing. We thought we would we, we were discovering conserved processes that are really the same in frog eggs and let's say a dividing human embryo cell or a human cancer cell. Um, and it, and it, I, I tried to minimize in my head the differences. Now, now, as we know more about these different kinds of cells, the, the differences start to get interesting. And one of the striking things about a frog egg is just how big it is. A typical dividing human cell might be 10 microns, so that's that's a one, one hundredth of a millimeter. Times smaller. So a hundred times smaller linearly, and then by volume you have to cube that number. Mm -hmm. And if you, one of the kind of so classic, yes, wow. by volume, right. Yeah. One, one of the, the sort of overarching problems in cell biology in a way is, is how do molecules, which are tiny, organize cells, which are large, and, and, and then if the cell's really large, then you know that problem is, is even, even more so, because the frog egg divides every half hour, roughly, and in that half hour, it has to assemble a physical structure that can, for, for example, the first, we call them cleavage in the frog eggs. The first cleavage cuts exactly down the middle, and the second cleavage cuts exactly at right angles, and, and so it's a system of molecules positioning themselves in space, microtubules specifically, as, as we were talking about, that positions that cleavage furrow, and, and how it can do it on this huge spatial scale is just is, is kind of mind-bending. So what's, what's, the, what, what's the, spe are the specific challenges for the organization of the microtubule, microtubule structure in a large cell? I mean, you know, is, is there a structural challenge? And also, when does it, how does There's it know when There's a structural stop? challenge and also a temporal challenge. Yeah. I mean, one question is how long can a microtubule get? Can a microtubule grow right from the centrosome mm -hmm. in the middle to the outside, which is roughly half a millimeter? And we studied that process pretty carefully. Not, we, 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 we sometimes use eggs, but they're difficult to study because they're opaque. We have to fix them and, and stain them and, and clear them. But we often make a, an extract. We, we pack a bunch of eggs in a tube and crush them, and we can get this layer of cytoplasm. We'll do a lot of the same biology. So that's how most of our experiments go. And when we studied, so, so the egg is organized by radial arrays of, of, of microtubules that are called asters. And, Actually, what they look like is Fourth of July fireworks. You know the kind of firework that shoots out from a central point? There's a whole bunch of lines. It's pretty much exactly what an aster looks like. And going in, we assumed that the microtubules will go all the way from the middle to the mm -hmm. outside. But when we look carefully using proteins that mark the tips of the microtubules, we realize actually the aster are, are made up of a whole bunch of little microtubules that are kind of nested so that they, they, they grow out from the sides of each other. So it's more like a tree. Um, it's more like a tree, stuff. exactly. Yeah. If, exactly. I mean, there, yes, there are bushes where every shoot grows you know, from uh -huh. the roots right up. But if you want to build a big tree, you, you make branches. Yes, right. it, that's, that's actually you know, quite analogous. And I think, I think the reason you have to do that just may be mechanical, actually, just like with a tree, it probably wouldn't be physically possible to, to build it with every shoot going down to the root, something like that. So does that mean you need different things in frogs to create the branches more than you would That's a good question, a, and I must admit that. we haven't nailed the molecular basis of that. The, the molecular basis of, of creating a microtubule, nucleating it, we call it, you, you, you seed it. So we, we think there's a kind of molecular seed, and we have not solved the molecular mechanism of this growth from the side of microtubules. And, you know, I, I would like to do that. Um, the frog egg system, we, we don't have, for example, genetics in frog eggs, so it's, it's a really good system for microscopy for studying the physiology of proteins you already know about. It's not quite as good for discovering new proteins for the first time. You can, but uh, other systems tend to be better for that. So, so you, and, and returning to what you were saying a little bit earlier, so you, you have this kind of this distance problem, but then a geometry problem as the well. The geometry problem the really fascinates me. How do you find the middle, for example? Mm -hmm. and, and also, how do these microtubules 
The, from the outside, what you see when a frog egg is you see these cleavage furrows that cut down. They cut the egg into two and then in four. And the, it turns out that the, the cleavage furrows, where their position is when two of these microtubule acids touch each other, um, where the plus ends overlap, you, you recruit, you, you imagine sort of two domes touching each other, mm -hmm. and in the middle, there's a, that defines a plane, and there's a, several proteins we've been working on that recruited at that plane, and as the asters grow, that plane grows out to the surface, and then mm -hmm. when it touches the surface, it, it stimulates the cortex to contract, and so that's sort of understanding this plane that's formed where the two asters touch has been right. one of the main And the fact things that it's doing. perpendicular to the axis is de determined by the microtubules? Yes. There's a, a second fact. You have to know what positions the center of the asters and, and what positions the microtubules. And um, one of the one part is that when the microtubules grow into something, that is a boundary and they, they stop growing. And they also, when they grow, the two acids grow into each other, that, that's a, another boundary. They stop growing in the middle there. We've, we've been working on that. Uh, a second factor is how the nucleating sites are positioned. And, and that, we've been working on that. I think we've made less progress on that. We know uh, another motor protein, uh, dynein, is involved in that. And um, so, for example, one version of the problem is You've cleaved the egg in two. Now the next pharaoh is going to be at 90 degrees. Where does that angle come from? And it, it comes from finding the long axis of the cell. And we think that the geometry of the microtubules controls the net forces that are acting on them. It's a bit hard to explain in, in, with my hands. And, and, and that's what positions the next pharaoh. Although I would say that there's a, actually a lot we still don't know about that. I, I don't want to pretend we know more than we do. <coughs> Well, it certainly sounds there's a, like there's a there's a lot still to there, still there to, is there to, is, to, to is. and it's kind of, I mean these are it's part of the fun, one of the fun things is these these are people have been looking at frog eggs and wondering how they make those cleavage furrows for more than a hundred years. So there is lovely experiments we refer to from the 1890s and 1910s. I, I think I have one 1910 image in my talk, and we actually repeated those experiments. We got the same result, and then but we're able to take it further now. We have some of the molecules. So that sort of stepping in the in the tracks of the people who came before is, is part of the fun of it. Yeah, well, that's, that, that, that's great. It's, it, it's, it's wonderful to hear, and um, good luck with the next 100 years of microtubule research. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. It's been great talking to okay, you. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. very much. We're going to...